thank you for being uh, with us this afternoon. I'm Rod Howe. I'm the executive director of the History Center in Tompkins County. Uh, and we're delighted that this is one in a series of programs that we're doing as part of the Made in Tompkins County exhibit. So if you take time and walk around this timeline, of course it was hard to decide what businesses and industries, it's really a representational sampling, but I think you'll start to see that there's been an entrepreneurial spirit uh, in this community for quite some time. And that's partly what we want to uh, hear about today. Probably focus more on the past few decades, but I wanted to see the thought that there's been an entrepreneurial spirit in this community. One of the things that uh, I just want to mention, we always like you to know what do we have in our archives uh, related to whatever topic we're talking about. And certainly we have a collection focused on Ithaca Industries. Uh, we have a collection on Ithaca Organizations. Uh, certainly some major business collections such as Ithaca Gun Company, Cuga Rock Saw Company, Ithaca Calendar, Clock Collection, Morse Chain, Borg Warner, et cetera. So if you're interested in exploring more fully some of the industries and businesses, please come in to our research library and we'll orient you to our archival material. A mention of some upcoming programs related uh, to this exhibit on February, if you like beer, on February 3rd, uh, which will be part of First Friday Gallery Night, Ithaca Beer will be making a presentation about their business and they've promised to bring beer. Uh, so uh, come that the next day on February 4th will be a similar panel, but it's going to focus on business, businesses in our midst that value place. I'll let you play with that. What does that mean? So look for our, our marketing material that will go out about that. But uh, Martha Armstrong will be moderating that session. And then on February 18th, uh, which is actually the last day that the exhibit will be up, how many, are you, how many of you are familiar with the makerspace movement and the Ithaca Generator? So there's going to be a presentation on that program and there's going to be some interactive things that you can play with and make that day. Uh, but today is Entrepreneurs Then and Now. Again, if, if uh, you look at the timeline, I think you'll see uh, glimpses of that entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, and certainly there's many manufacturing businesses represented, but along this wall as well, we've got anything from candy, uh, making candy, to making ice cream, uh, to beer. Um, Obviously, in the marketing material, we use the image of Ezra Cornell. So he was obviously an entrepreneur uh, in Tompkins, an entrepreneur writ large, but then certainly had some, uh, some important things that he made happen here in Ithaca and Tompkins County. But you know, I was thinking of that term. I don't think we're really going to go in, into trying to define entrepreneurs or entrepreneurship. Maybe somebody will. I use a pretty broad definition of that. So I, w I was thinking even uh, someone like Peter Webb. You might not know too much about Peter Webb. Peter Webb was brought here as a slave uh, and ended up in Caroline, but he bought his own freedom from his owner. Uh, and then the family ended up buying the property where he used to be a slave. Uh, so. Okay, I think there's an entrepreneurial spirit in that kind of activity. Uh, I don't know if the name Celia Hazlitt Smith means anything to anyone, to Celia Hazlitt Smith. So our Ithaca Kitty, if you're familiar with Ithaca Kitty, she was the one who created the doll. She had a cat named Caesar. She looked at her cat one day, this was in the 1890s, and said, I think I'm going to make a toy of Caesar. And it was sold. Uh, around the world, uh, primarily in the U.S. and major department stores. It was at the World's Fair in, Chica in Chicago. So the Ithaca Kitty became pretty renowned and she did pretty well for herself. So she was an entrepreneur. So entrepreneurs cover a whole range of concerns. Uh, one of the folks who couldn't be with us today is a representative of the Alternatives Federal Credit Union. So on the table around that column, uh, they have a new program starting called Becoming a Business Owner 101, an action plan for entrepreneurs. So if you know of anyone who might be interested in that class, go ahead and pick up the brochure uh, over there. 
obviously the focus today is, is uh, more recent, so um, Larry Baum and I have been working back and forth on this program. Larry is the founder of the Computing Center, and I'm going to turn it over to him now. Oh, actually there's one other thing I want to mention before I do that. Uh, we also have a book in our over there for sale uh, called Enterprising Families, and the author of that book just happened to walk in, Carol Sisler. Uh, so that's another way, I hope that you'll take a chance just to skim through the book over there uh, to glance at, at the families that she wrote about. Uh, and again, that starts to hint at this entrepreneurial spirit uh, that's been in the county for a while. And Carol, as we have dialogue back and forth, please feel free to chime in on anything that you want to chime in on. We're delighted to have you here today. So Larry, now I will turn it over to you. <laughs> Thank you, <Pam. laughs> Thank you, Rod. Hi, I'm Larry Baum. Um, what I just found out is that uh, our panel today uh, was all, all grew up in this area. Uh, I didn't, actually didn't know that. Uh, of course, I didn't know that uh, Brad Treat is now Tom Shriver until about uh, uh, 15 minutes ago. It all, it all works. So uh, one of the parts about being important aspects of being a entrepreneur is being able to uh, go with the flow, make changes on the fly, and here we are, making changes on the fly. So. Uh, I did take a look at what uh, definition of entrepreneur is. Uh, it comes from the French, and uh, it says literally one who undertakes some task. I like what Tom said to me earlier. He said, it's amazing that French don't have a word for entrepreneur, but <laughs> they do. Uh, in the Google Dictionary, it says a person who organizes, manages any enterprise, especially a business, usually with considerable initiative and risk. I like the risk part, because that's kind of the way we've worked uh, for uh, going on 40 years. And so when you talk about then and now, I get the feeling that we're pushing now, right then, uh, pretty, rap pretty rapidly. Uh, in almost 40 years ago, uh, we, I was uh, doing uh, photography and writing both uh, for the Ithaca Journal and Syracuse newspapers and a few other things. And, but I always had this idea of starting this company uh, having to do with computers. And uh, I, so we got together, uh, actually three of us, and very rapidly became two of us, and uh, we started a company that became the Computing Center. And uh, in that time, we had a list of, so this was the late 70s, we had a list of clients, some of which were technology companies uh, that either had started or were starting, uh, and had uh, uh, interesting impact both on our business and in, in the community. Uh, I kind of look back and at some of my list of early clients and uh, companies like uh, Precision Filters came up. They were around the corner from where we started our business. So I started our business in my mother's house and on Willow Avenue. And from my old bedroom, I could look through across the way onto Day Street uh, at the old Ithaca Calendar Clock Factory. Another business from the, uh, you know, the, the uh, 1800s. At that time, though, it was uh, Petrolos Laundry. When you take a look at entrepreneurship in its broadest sense, that's uh, another entrepreneurial business that was here for, for many, many decades. Um, other companies, Seaboard, Ithaca Intersystems, a uh, little company called Jamex, which is very interesting because depending on, that started actually a little later, actually I think 81, but uh, Tony might have something to say about that. Um, we spun off another company another company called Automated Environments uh, in, the, in the early 80s. The whole idea of taking risk, going out and starting something, and uh, in whether it's in technology or 
business. My father was uh, started a farm in 1949. Uh, he had no background in farming. Uh, he had come to the United States after World War II and decided he wanted to be a farmer. So he, he took a risk. And uh, that farm ran until uh, about 1996. Uh, so locally, I grew up, I realized later, with a lot of people who were very entrepreneurial. People either went to school with or their parents and the names kind of, you know, walked down through a list. Uh, uh, many names, Morse family, of course, Moog. Uh, I remember doing a, uh, uh, a photography assignment with, with, uh, with Moog up in Trumansburg uh, in, in, in the 70s before they left to go off to the big city of Buffalo, uh, you know, getting their start here. Uh, Sproles with Therm, uh, Deans with Dean Co, uh, Abbott, Silverstein, uh, you know, Schulman, Ruoff, Hall, Cutting, Pritchard. Lots of names over the last hundred years that kind of you know, cross our time because they were tended to be you know old, older when I was a kid. Uh, that uh, were all people that uh, had the spirit of starting and maintaining and running a business. So I'm going to talk more about that, but I want to introduce our panel. Um, Brad Treat is <laughs> going to be our first speaker. Actually, Tom Shriver. Tom, I didn't know, was a, is a local. I think a high school grad. Um, okay. I think a high 68. So, <laughs> a bit younger. Uh, Cornell MBA, number of n number of businesses, but now back at the back at the university officially, and uh, he'll tell you more about uh, his day job. And uh, if you get him offline, he's got a Tesla. And what's really cool about that car? It's changing the way cars are built, sold, managed. Totally different. Uh, Evan Williams. Evan is someone I just met, and uh, looking at his background, uh, another local person, but comes from not necessarily technology, but uh, art, art history. And uh, we're hearing from him. Uh, Tony Eisenhut. Uh, I didn't know was local. At least he, got, he was born here. He left after six months, but he did come back, uh, and uh, has been probably for everyone that I know in Ithaca. He's on the short list of having been involved with the most businesses uh, in in this community. So we're going to start with Tom, and uh, we'll go on to Evan, and then Tony, and then uh, because it's a relatively small group, we're going to try to get a conversation going. On uh, what uh, what you'd like to hear about, and uh, part of things is like, you know, what's changed in my mind. I'd be curious to hear what the other folks think. Huh. Oh. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks. So, uh, as you heard, I'm standing in for uh, my colleague, Brad Treat. I'm happy to be here with you today. Um, as you heard, my day job, I work for Cornell University. So, somehow or another, I went from entrepreneur to academic bureaucrat. Not quite sure what happened there. But uh, um, but the, the role that I have is to uh, work on uh, helping people start and grow new businesses. Um, some of the stuff we do is on campus. Some of the stuff we do is in the community. And so, the main focus of what I want to talk about here today is in the community. So I want to um, give you a little bit of history since about 1970 of business incubation uh, here uh, in Tompkins County and in Ithaca. But let me uh, start with one step kind of beyond that, which is um, why the role that I have at Cornell exists and what our kind of interest is in this. Um, so obviously, uh, you know, the history of Ezra Cornell, he's the, the, the kind of picture at the beginning of this, uh, is one uh, well known uh, to us. And, and obviously Cornell um, being a 
being the largest employer in Tompkins County, I think in about a 50 mile radius, um, has been invested in the community here for a very long time. And I think it's a reciprocal investment, really. I mean, the university does better uh, if our local area does better. As the university goes to recruit globally recognized faculty, for example, the more we can be a vibrant place to be, the better off we are for that. Um, the same with, uh, you know, fantastic uh, students who are, uh, you know, competed for all over the world. Um, if you look at the employment picture uh, for Tompkins County, it's actually interesting. Um, eight of the top ten employers in Tompkins County are uh, not for profits or governments. Um, three of those top ten are institutions of higher education. So uh, Cornell, but also, of course, TC3 and Ithaca College. Um, if you look at the two private uh, employers on that top ten, one uh, is Borg Warner, so what is now uh, the, the what's remained of Morse, so Morse chain is right, right there, 1880, the timing chain invented in Trumansburg, uh, right up the road. Um, and so they are the largest uh, private employer in Tompkins County. The second largest, interesting, another uh, upstate New York entrepreneurial success story, that being Wegmans. Uh, that Wegmans store actually hires a lot of people. Um, so they make the top 10. But there are some interesting implications to that. So if you think about us as an institution at Cornell being um, being really part of the community, invested in the community, and wanting and needing the community to be a vibrant place, if three of the top ten employers are institutions of higher education, uh, and two of those three being private institutions, the two by far largest employers, uh, I don't need to tell any of you here in the room what's happened to private university tuition over the last 30 years. It's gone up double inflation. The other uh, large employers you've got the Racker Centers, you've got CMC, right? So I don't also need to tell you what's happened to healthcare costs over the last 30 years. Also have gone up very much faster than inflation. So if you think for a moment of other communities where the main thing that happens there has been expanding at a rate double inflation, double the base economy, we're basically Fort McMurray, Alberta. And I would say education costs and healthcare costs are our cost of oil. So we've been in a boom market here for the last 30 years. So what happens for the next 30 years? I think my crystal ball is as cloudy as any of yours, but it's hard to imagine trends that have not reverted to the mean over some multi-generational multi period of time, which means where is the thriving economy going to come from going forward? Well, it hopefully will come from other private employers, other diversified employment bases like the the kind of employers that you see here around the room, which is why we as a university have been willing and interested to uh, invest in business incubation and to take what we do in our business programs and in engineering and other places and extend it into the community consistent with the land grant mission that we have in our origins to help people start and grow new businesses. As I mentioned, some of those things have happened on campus. We've got a number of programs, some of which I'm affiliated with, other folks, um, to do business incubation and business startups around Cornell Technology. Um, but I want to talk for a moment about uh, a couple um, pieces of history here, since this is the history center. Um, so if you look back in 1970s, um, there was actually kind of a first wave of business incubation. There was a business incubator at the airport um, that had five companies in it. Four were shut down quite rapidly. Um, one was not. That company uh, was called Seaboard. Um, and Seaboard at the time um, was growing from a startup perspective at what felt to the people who were involved a relatively slow rate. What we've now come to know is that Seaboard grew at about 20% a year for, oh, about 35 years, um, which uh, if you've ever kind of taken that kind of compounding math, that's a lot. <laughs> um, and so uh, that effort was actually viewed as a failure, although I think in retrospect, we look back on it now and those 300 or some employees that are at uh, Seaboard and it's now a successor company, um, um, and you'd say, no, that, that was actually pretty successful. So I think lesson number one is these are extraordinarily long-term investments. So when you look at the kind of economic impact that startups can have, sure, you know, we count jobs on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And I'm proud of the jobs that the companies that we've supported have created last year. Um, but really, when you want to look at impact, it's 10, 20, 30 years out when you start to get to the meaningful numbers. So in the 1990s, um, we had the repurposing of 
of a building uh, called Langmuir Lab on Brown Road. Um, and a gentleman named George Schneider, who recently retired uh, from being a lecturer at the Johnson School, um, and some other folks were tasked with taking that Brown Road space um, and turning it into a business incubator. Uh, one of the things, though, that was a requirement was they wanted to get rent money. And so essentially they said, great, go, go rent these spaces to startups. Just make sure you do it on exactly the same terms that you would offer other companies. Um, and they wound up not. Uh, they found some companies. It's actually a space that's still used today by a number of startups. Um, and they have some great lab space that's available. But what they found was that um, by trying to view it as a real estate play, they weren't successful as they wanted to be uh, in getting things going. And so uh, if lesson number one is that this is a long-term play, lesson number two is when you think about business incubation, it cannot be viewed as a solution to a real estate problem. It's not a real estate play. Um, we have a housing crisis in this county, so we have a residential real estate crisis. We do not have a commercial real estate crisis. And I don't know of any company that didn't start because they didn't have a place to go. So uh, really, you can't view this as solely like, oh, well, we have this space. Let's go rent it out, and everything will be better. So you need to do more than that. The next thing that happened um, was in the mid to late 2000s, and I'm using my colleague Brad's uh, words here. He's actually being a little bit um, humble. He was really a catalyst for this. Um, there were a group of, of primarily technology startup CEOs, of which he was one, um, who started getting together over uh, coffee and breakfast to uh, kibitz uh, to talk about what it was like to you know, license intellectual property or build a team or raise capital and um, which were the better or not so good uh, venture capitalists to work with. Um, and so what we found out of this experience was really a need for community. Um, so this is the kind of thing entrepreneurship happens better when it happens together. There's a lot of economic uh, research about this around uh, cluster economies and so on. And so um, having people in this startup phase who can work with each other and learn from each other is critically important. Um, which brings us to where we are today with our efforts. Um, and so in 2014, it's got my name on it, but that's actually, uh, I think, a little bit overly generous on Brad's part. Um, the person that I would actually really credit uh, for, for helping us do what we've uh, been able to do is former uh, Cornell President David Scorton, who's now uh, the Secretary of the Smithsonian. Um, it was him in 2013 saying, the state is interested in making some investments. We can leverage our own interest. We can get Ithaca College and CC3 on board and get some state money to do more around business incubation in the community, um, which is exactly what we did. Um, he himself uh, literally called uh, President Roshan at Ithaca College and President Haynes at TC3 and said, let's get together and go do something here. Um, and that led to uh, what is now Rev Ithaca Startup Works, literally just uh, kitty corner across the street in a building owned by Travis High Properties. And I would also give David credit for negotiating our lease, which was pretty cool. Not often do you get the president of the university calling up. And I'm sure uh, Frost Travis was probably a little surprised to get that phone call as well. So I'm very thankful for Travis High Properties' support uh, and their very generous terms uh, that they were willing to give us. Um, and also on this space as well. I believe they're the owner of this building. Um, so now we have a, a business incubator across the street. And just to kind of tie it all back together, what we're trying to do is make long-term investments. So we're taking a long view recognizing that of the almost 40 companies that we're working with right now, there are probably a large number of them that may not wind up succeeding in their current phase. And that's kind of OK. We have to be OK with that. We can't even really predict which ones are successful. As we often joke, sometimes an entrepreneur will turn themselves into the Kool-Aid man and run through a brick wall. And even though you saw the brick wall, you get surprised that they were able to run through it. And so the key thing for us is to create an environment where we can get as many of those people together so that the ones that will succeed will. And hopefully Hopefully some of them will come on uh, later on to be the next Morse chain slash Borg Warner uh, and so on. Um, so we're really about building the community, being a community, uh, as opposed to a space solution. Um, and we're, we're very pleased with where we've been able to come uh, in just two short years. Right, so I'm Evan Williams. Um, I believe I was asked here uh, to represent Tompkins Connect, a young professionals organization that uh, I've been a part of for several years, uh, been on their board. Uh, I'm also an independent art appraiser and uh, as of late an auction specialist affiliated with Worth Auctions. Um, I also realized that I could talk to you a little bit about uh, the, the then as well as the now of entrepreneurialism and Tompkins County. 
I was actually uh, born into uh, a very early digital home office in, in Ithaca almost exactly 30 years ago. That's me uh, top left with a uh, uh, Radio Shack uh, portable computer. Radio Shack in front of Some other uh, wonderful relics there. Uh, my... Uh, <laughs> My parents were uh, pioneers in, in interactive media. Uh, they ran a business called Omnicom Associates that uh, later became Gajewski Analytics. Uh, they worked with clients like Fiat and Ben and & Jerry's and the Ministry of Education of Turkey and uh, hundreds of others. And uh, growing up, my very first memories were the squeal of Betamax tapes being rewound in our upstairs office. and of business people and scholars from all over the world traipsing through our house. And uh, naturally, I thought this was just the way it was. And of course, I thought that every house must have you know, the family entrance and the, uh, and the, the client entrance. Um, I, I, I thought this was just how, how every family grew up, I guess. Um, so clearly, I, I thought of Ithaca and Tompkins County as a very fruitful place for entrepreneurship from the from the very beginning, from the very start of the the digital revolution. Um, my my parents came here initially to uh, to work at, at Ithaca College, uh, but very soon thereafter met each other and, and started this business as well. Um, for their business, there was a, a great synergy and, and crossover with both campuses. Um, they early on, starting in 1981, they ran interactive media workshops at Ithaca Colleges, at Ithaca College, with uh, speakers from all over the world, uh, media pioneers, including Ante Pakislati from uh, Finland, and people from the Netherlands and from all over the U.S. Um, Cornell was also uh, a tremendous resource for them. Um, Cornell had uh, something called CUC Me, I, I believe, which was a very early uh, predecessor to uh, Skype, which was very useful to them. Um, also, it was a huge draw for talent that they could draw on uh, as, as entrepreneurs, um, just in terms of human capital. Um, my father heard tell of a brilliant physicist recently from NASA who had uh, recently become affiliated with Cornell, who was <clears throat> living in Ithaca with his robot domestic partner, I, I kid you not, and uh, he, he had apparently invented the world's first, uh, in addition to his robot, had, had invented his the world's first uh, functional digital modem. And uh, they ran into each other on the commons and started up a conversation. And uh, in due course, my, my parents hired him as, uh, as a consultant. And, uh, you know, this kind of thing simply doesn't happen in other communities, at least not with quite so much, uh, with quite so much ease as it might happen in a community like this. Um, and this is all to say nothing of Moosewood, which we really can't underestimate as, uh, as a draw for, for clients. Uh, and, and I'm really not being facetious. It, it really was a, a, an enormous... Uh, benefit for clients to come all over, all over the world and be able to eat in Moosewood and uh, in general to enjoy the beautiful natural setting uh, of Ithaca as a place for brainstorming and retreats. Um, even in the times when it was not such great weather, there was a time when there was a huge snowstorm and my parents were conducting a workshop with a number of executives from Mexico and they had started to look very antsy and look out the window and finally they just rushed up from the table and burst out the door and started throwing snowballs at each other and it had turned out that none of them had ever seen snow before. And so it, it actually worked out that Ithaca's, what we love about Ithaca, it's sort of the, the cosmopolitan and the, the rural and natural beauty, that, that combination that we love about it is, is what made it a wonderful place for, for clients to come and, and uh, have productive meetings as well. Um, so I went to Ithaca College and graduated with a uh, major in art history, minor in economics, uh, with a view to being an art appraiser. And uh, I was positively disposed to Ithaca as a venue for my own entrepreneurialist 
uh, pursuits, of course, you know, growing up uh, as I did. Uh, but of course, I was also very positively disposed to New York City being the art capital of the world. And I went down there for an internship at an auction house and pursued my appraisal certification there and got a master's. And uh, I felt a very strong draw there as well. And, and so I had a, a hard time figuring out whether my future would be in Manhattan or in, or in Ithaca. And um, for personal reasons, I, I came back to Ithaca after a couple of years. And, and that's when I discovered that there was actually quite a downfall to Ithaca as, a, as an entrepreneurial community, which is that there is a lot of transience here. And for somebody who grew up here, I felt that without a foothold in one of the campus communities, I felt that there had almost been a brain drain, that the people that I had grown up with had scattered, and that uh, I had sort of felt like almost a, uh, a stranger in my own hometown a little bit. Um, it was, a, it was a little bit of an alienated ex experience for a little while until I had talked with Rob LaHood, the late, great Rob LaHood from the chamber, who said, well, you really ought to look at Tompkins Connect, and I had never heard of that. He said, well, you know, you should you know, just send him an email. I'll, I'll do the introductions. And uh, so I... Um, went to one of their meetings, and it, it, it turned out to be, um, at that time, uh, sort of an emerging group of young professionals um, housed within, uh, under two different nonprofits, the uh, Tompkins County Chamber of Commerce and uh, the United Way. Um, and uh, I began to get involved with them. Um, they had sort of a dual mission of, um, providing social and business networking, and then uh, sort of a service and volunteering component, which also had a social networking component as well. Um, and uh, in the last, that was 2012 when I got involved, and so in the last several years, the membership has grown to over 800 members in, uh, over the county, uh, people between the ages of 21 and 40, uh, typically. Um, although we're not sticklers about chronology per se. Um, and uh, it really gave me a sense that there were people that were here uh, purposefully, uh, people of my years that were here um, who were entrepreneurs and people who were here who wanted to uh, do pr things that were productive in, in the professional realm. and, and the realm of, uh, of the nonprofit world as well. Um, so, this is kind of what my current Vista looks like. The technology is much smaller and sleeker. And as you can see, I'm surrounded by a lot of like minded people. Uh, and through Tompkins Connect, I've done a lot of uh, very productive networking that's led to good friendships uh, and uh, also has very recently led to my current position, as, which is sort of an entrepreneurship, an entrepreneur with an I instead of an E at uh, Worth Auctions. Um, basically, I've taken my independent art appraisal practice and folded it into uh, under the shingle of uh, this new auction house in Freeville. And uh, that was a direct result of, of networking at one of uh, Tompkins Connect's major um, uh, annual events called Fab Five, the Fab Five uh, Young Professionals Awards, which is our, in Tompkins County's answer to the sort of under, the under 40 or under 30 awards that many places do. So my, uh, my advice to anybody who's sort of in my general demographic is that Tompkins Connect is a, is a worthwhile uh, place to check out. And, and my, my advice to anybody who is not is that uh, Tompkins Connect is a tremendous um, retention tool. I think that, um, as I said, to Ithaca and Tompkins County is just um, 
has so many blessings, and I think one of its downfalls is the sense of transience. And I think that um, anything that we can do to give a sense of continuity and community for people who are uh, in the younger years is uh, exceedingly important. So uh, just in closing, I'll note that uh, we uh, we are coming sort of full circle in terms of the, the then and now in that uh, worth auctions and our upcoming uh, sale in February is uh, among our lots is an 1879 Ithaca calendar clock, beautifully restored. And uh, if nothing else, you should come and check it out. It's a it's a beautiful piece that comes fully documented from the uh, from the factory right on state and, and plain. And it's a beautiful artifact of the whole story of entrepreneurship in, in the area. So that's my sort of very personal take on then and now. Uh, my name's Tony Eisenhut. I'm with Kensa Group, and uh, we are in the business of starting businesses. I've been in Ithaca this time around, since the first time didn't count, according to Larry, because um, it was too short since uh, 1999. Um, well, I guess 84, I did a stint here during uh, college, spent four years here, um, and then came back, um, relocated our family here um, to start a business in, in Tompkins County in, in Ithaca. Um, you know, the, the guys have covered a lot, I guess, of the, the nuts and bolts um, of uh, what's gone on from a now and then history perspective. And I, I'm going to just try to make some summary comments about, uh, I guess, the overlay as I see the, the ecosystem um, then as well as as it exists now from a personal perspective. And so, um, you know, some of my experiences um, came into focus much later but when I first came to, to Cornell um, what I experienced was that Ithaca is kind of a unique place it is a unique place you know you talk about 10 miles square miles surrounded by reality um, there's a lot of truth in that and, and not in a, a negative way sometimes there's a negative connotation to it um, I look at it today as it's 10 square miles surrounded by upstate New York's reality. But the reality of Ithaca is not that unusual when you go to other places in the country. Um, and I say Cambridge, but they have an institution there that we don't like to talk about um, as far as college education goes. Um, but whether it's West Coast, East Coast, Research Triangle, and you can pick Austin, Texas, um, you know, Ithaca was, a very entrepreneurial, accepting, open-minded community um, long before some of those places existed as they do today. Um, a lot has to do with Cornell, a lot has to do with the history that exists here in the, in the walls, but it all comes back to the people. And that's what I found in whether it was, you know, showing up on campus and um, deciding that I was gonna play hockey and I, I use the word participate more than play because um, in hindsight, I've come to learn that I think my GPA was more of the uh, contribution I made to the team than my actual hockey skills. But there were people in the university, despite the fact that he wasn't that good, who treated me as here's someone different in the hockey world and whether it's you know Doc Sisler being as supportive of what I was doing in my academic career as he was to Mike Schaefer or someone else who was much more capable that acceptance is something that I think this community has brought to entrepreneurs for years and years and years and you know you talk about the business entrepreneurs you're doing something different you want to start a business you're going to do something unique that generally takes unique people and you need to be in a place where there's an ecosystem and environment this is that is accepting of that uniqueness um, and and I think Ithaca has done a, a fantastic job you know Larry made mention of a few people who when I came back to Ithaca in 99 um, I got to meet through some of the experiences when I was here as, as a student um, you talk about a, a Dave Cutting or a, a Dave Abbott or the Moosewood people um, you know to be quite frank um, you know I enjoy hunting. I enjoy eating meat. 
You know, that doesn't really fit real well with the Moosewood crowd. Um, except for when I spent time with the Moosewood people because we were working on a project together, they were very accepting of the skills I brought to their table and they learned a little about camo and I learned a lot about vegetarian eating and <laughs> the life that they lead. And at the end of the day, um, we made some really nice things happen together and they've um, you know, been a huge uh, recognition for Ithaca really around the globe. You talk about institutions like Ithaca Gun. You talk about institutions like uh, Moosewood and institutions Cornell. Depending on what circles you walk in, in different parts of the world, there are people who know Ithaca because of Ithaca Gun. And, oh, is there a university there? <laughs> yeah, there's Cornell. And there's people who know Cornell who wouldn't know that there were these other in institutions. Um, and what I've found over the years in the involvements that I've had is that that personal connection, whether it's getting advice from, you know, one of the uh, people who have gone before us, the Abbots, the Cuttings, um, or, you know, needing those people today for an introduction or a connection or some type of support, um, that's what's made a lot of the successes in this community so important. And, you know, Cornell's a, a great resource for the community, but if you're not careful, it can be isolating as well. And, and I think um, one of the things that the, my experience here has been is that Cornell, the community, um, alumni who want alums who want to be here but aren't here um, can come to bear on on the businesses of, of this community um, and allow for growth not just locally not just in upstate New York not just across New York but across the country and and really are around the world and so um, you know I, I'll just give you a, a personal experience of this personal connection. Um, you know, you talk about Dave Abbott, and if anyone knows Dave Abbott, um, he was quite a man, and he was quite a character. Um, and, you know, he was very much a business person where the old challenge industry uh, building was, the, the pink building. That used to be their their business and they made uh, women's undergarments that sold um, across the, the country. And I think at one point in time, if I remember right, there were like 400 um, women, you know, sewing um, undergarments over there for distribution around. And, and he was very much a part of this community. They ran a business but they were involved in you know, Cornell activities, they were involved in Ithaca activities, um, and it was very important to them. I don't think there was much of a differentiation between business, community, Cornell, IC, Ithaca College. It kind of was all one big melting pot with what they did in their daily lives. And so, you know, we had uh, purchased a business up in actually Seneca Falls. So it wasn't here locally um, and we were looking for some money. And so uh, we got introduced to Dave Abbott and um, Dave uh, used to live up in Aurora at this point in time and went up to see him. And, you know, he couldn't have a conversation if you weren't eating. So, of course, he has to cook something. Um, good Syrian heritage, so everything was about food. And, and we sat there and we ate and we talked to his wife. Um, then he told me he was very busy and basically kicked me out. And <laughs> said he wanted to meet next week. We went up to the plant. He walked around the plant, talked to 15, 20 people, um, and then told me, to show up the next day at his house. So I show up the next day at his house and uh, he said, you know, um, are you good for the money? Yeah, we're good for the money. Okay, um, we're gonna make a loan to you. And at that point it was over, you know, this is 15 years ago, almost 20 years ago now, um, $750,000, it's a lot of money. Um, and he gave me a sheet of paper. It said, and his wife was there, Roe, it said, I promise to pay blank amount back so that Roe does not become homeless. <laughs> Here's your name. Okay, sign, sign away. He gives us a check and we were able to put an addition on a building, hire 50 more people, provide benefits, et cetera. Um, you know, it, 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 it was to me just an example of only things that are gonna happen that are good are gonna happen if you rely on the, the 
the good people um, and that people um, are willing to give other people a chance. And so all of the things that we've talked about from an entrepreneurship standpoint um, are come back to these social networks that um, have existed in Ithaca and will continue. There was an organization um, called FLEF, Finger Lakes Entrepreneurs Forum, that existed for a number of years, and Roger Williams was kind of the um, push behind that. Roger's since passed away. But it was a, a, a great, great organization where people from all walks of life, Cornell, the entrepreneurial community here. And, and one of the things that I fear when you talk about the now and someone's got to be negative, so I might as well sign up for that, you know, part of it, is with, with some of the technologies that we have, some of the specialization that we have, that everyone become, becomes so focused on their particular area, industry, domain expertise, that they don't cross silos. Um, and an organization like FLEF and what they used to do force people to cross silos and have dialogues and communication. It, it, you know, force people to meet weird people. You know, whatever your definition of weird is. But people from all walks of life were coming together to talk about their businesses and things happen from it. And so I think in this community, which has done it so well for so many years, um, we have to ask the question, are we continuing to foster those types of relationships so that we can grow our entrepreneurial community? Um, because there are more resources today for an entrepreneur to start a business than I think there ever have been. There's more money than there was before. There's more uh, support as to, you know, what are business functions and how do you handle them and what do you do with them. Um, and they exist from, you know, the digital world to the engineering world to, um, you know, the, the chemistry, physical sciences world. And, um, you know, we just have to be careful. And uh, the other thing I guess I will say is that you have to have an expectation that time, and I don't remember who, who said the amount of time, but the world that I live in, we talk about the earliest stage from concept or sometimes an invention all the way through commercialization. And um, we started a company um, called Novamer, and, and Tom was, was part of Novamer and part of that journey. Um, you know, we first looked at Novamer in 1998, 99, I guess, it was um, actually launched the company after doing some early work on it in 2005-ish time frame um, and it will be 2019 when ultimately there are commercial products at a meaningful scale in the marketplace but over that course of time um, which you know is going to be 20 21 years um, a invention that came out of Ithaca is going to transform the way um, a number of people look at certain plastics. And it will be a global footprint um, as to what that impact was. Um, and it's making the environment a better place. It's a little bit of a sales pitch I'm, I'm giving you right now. But, um, you know, whether it's, you know, Jeff Coates and his lab at Cornell or Tom and the early team um, to the current team that we have now, ultimately to a production facility that we may be able to put in New York State or we may put it somewhere else around the globe. It started here in Ithaca and Ithaca will continue into the future to have uh, a fingerprint and a footprint on on the world at large. So those are my comments. Thanks, Tony. Thank you, gentlemen. A uh, couple notes. Uh, you know, as I hear these three folks talk, you end up, for me, start thinking about people and stories and, and, and how the, this community has had this entrepreneurial view to it for hundreds, hundreds of years now and uh, how it's really come together over the last 20 years where we now have uh, ecosystems. Uh, that uh, like kind of starting with FLEF, I think Tompkins Connect is very much like FLEF. From another, and certainly from a resource viewpoint, Rev, Rev is like that. Uh, in late 1995, Dave Cutting, someone who 
many of us know. Uh, our new is, is a, a, a car dealer, but really a community person. Uh, called up 50 people, and he called all 50 people. And he asked each one of them, including me, for $25,000 each. And 49 of them said yes. Not many people can do that. Uh, and that was the beginning of uh, Ithaca's, uh, was it first? I don't know if Cornell's had come later. Yeah, I think it was first, first venture capital fund. It was really an angel fund called Cuga Venture Fund. Cuga Venture Fund has now raising its fifth fund that I think tops out in the 40, 40-ish, somewhere in 40, uh, 35, 40 million dollars. And some of the people that were involved in that fund one are going to be involved in fund five. So people have been made, uh, Cuga Venture Fund was able to make successful investments uh, to companies, including a couple in this room. And, uh, uh, and many of the, much, much of the profit was rolled over. And it was a way to grow what Tony was talking about, the money. Uh, we talk about Ithaca being the place that it is and wherever we all travel to. Ithaca and Cornell and IC and TC3 keeps coming up. Uh, I've been in places all over the world and we kind of have this, my wife and I have this running joke now that we, we wait to see when is the Cornell or Ithaca connection going to happen. And it happens in very, very interesting and unusual places. The first time it happened to me, I was uh, uh, after school, went on a program over, uh, it was in Africa, and I was at a school, and a guy walks up to me and he says, how's that marinero doing? <laughs> and I look at, this is 1972, and I look at him and he said, I graduated from uh, uh, Cornell, uh, in uh, uh, the ag school uh, a couple years before. And I'm in a little rural school in Africa. You know, a year ago, February, we're in Singapore. And uh, we're walking down the street. Actually, we're in a mall. And my wife is looking at some silks and this woman comes up, uh, Chinese silks, but a woman who's not Chinese comes up, just starts talking to her. And we're just talking, you know, uh, and she says, where are, uh, where are you from? Upstate New York. Standard answer. She says, oh, where in upstate New York? Ithaca. My granddaughter's a crown. That happens all the time to all of us. Well, part of what happens, and I think, uh, you know, we talked about Ithaca being somewhat of a transient community, because if you really think of what the major uh, product of Ithaca, New York is, it's diplomas. We generate paper, and, and we generate educated people who get those pieces of paper, and we keep a few of them. And uh, I think part of what we all see is we want to still keep a few of them. We couldn't handle all of them, but uh, we, do want to, we do want to keep a few of them. So I want to thank you guys, but I would like to open it up a little bit and say, what would you guys like to talk about? One of the things that we're seeing a fair amount of now, uh, let me just make it personal with a, a particular story. Um, so there's a guy named Jake Reich. Uh, Jake graduated from Cornell a couple years ago. Um, Local-ish, grew up in Geneva, uh, kind of part of the, the, the broader Cornell community. Uh, started a company that started uh, with the name of Party Headphones, or Headphone Events, Party Headphones, then it became, what was it, Audiarchy, Audiarchy. now it's called Ever, Ever Sound. Um, so uh, Jake, being a great entrepreneur, I think made use of every single possible mentor or resource that exists and some that nobody even knew. He probably created ones along the way. Um, and, uh, and he's since left town, and we're, we're sad to see him go, but one of the things that's kind of neat is he's come back to visit, for example, and he's very much still tied and identifies with his community. And so one of the things that I think is actually a strength is that when people do decide to go somewhere else, because that's what's right for them or their company, they don't stop being part of 
you know, this place in a way. Um, so they're still part of the network, still part of the community, and I think that that's a really important attribute for us to continue to have. Sometimes people will ask me, and maybe they've asked you guys too, how do you convince people to stay? And I say, well, I don't, because really, if people are finding better opportunities elsewhere, it's better for them to make use of them and still feel like they're connected here, still feel like they're supported here, and now they become part of our broader network um, so that as we need these global resources, they can be part of that connection going out. Yes. Well, I'm Carol Sisler. <laughs> and what I wanted to do was to tie together the old families of Ithaca with the architecture that remains in the community. So um, just to very briefly, Ezra Cornell's history is not recorded in buildings left other than Cornell built after he died. Um, I own the Ezra Cornell Pottery, which is the foot of Lake Street across from the Fall Creek House. That was built by Ezra for his father to use as a pottery. So that's one Cornell connection. Um, McGraw, we know McGraw because of the McGraw Tower on Corn at Cornell. But he and Henry Sage were lumbermen and they took the risk to, to take the land grant that Cornell was given in Wisconsin and Michigan and cut that lumber and sell it um, you know, in, the, in the US. And so that's how they acquired their fortunes. Tom, we talked about the Morse family. The Morse chain is still on South Hill. But the Moore, Morse houses are in Cayuga Heights. Um, Jared Newman you know, created Cayuga Heights. So of course, he took the risk to buy that land and then to divide it up into, into uh, lots for private residences. Um, the Treman family, of course, um, established uh, first on their land grant military tract in Trumansburg. But their grandsons and, grand and uh, great grandsons all came to Ithaca. So what's mainly left here in their businesses is the, is the Tompkins County Trust Company, which they founded. Um, anyway, Edward Wyckoff, I guess I think he was probably one of our few failures. He had inherited quite a fortune and he sort of exploited it in various businesses that didn't su succeed, but his house is still here and Wyckoff Road is in Cayuga Heights. But I just want to tell you that this book contains the history of those families and a lot of photographs of the architecture that's left so that when you drive down the road like at University Ave, see the three Treman houses all together, you can say, oh yeah, that's, that's what that's about. Listen, congratulations to you all. I know it's, my father was an inventor. He took risks, and I took a risk publishing this book. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you, Carol. Uh, well, as, as you heard, I'm a local, I mean, so very much so. One of the things I'll often say to people is, you know, they'll ask, you know, how did I wind up back here? I've lived other places. Um, so not just an Ithaca High alum, but DeWitt Middle School and Caroline Elementary School, you know, way back when, right? And I think, uh, it, for me, it's something relatively simple. If, you're, if your mental image of what home looks like is this, you're not going to find it somewhere else. I think if you grew up in, you know, the New York suburbs of New Jersey and you wind up in Winnetka, Illinois, you know, sure, maybe the food culture is a little different and they root for different sports teams, but it's going to feel somewhat similar. Whereas I think a college town on the end of a lake and, I mean, it's like this kind of very unique thing and it is very attractive to certain people. So again, I think thinking about kind of our mission, it's not a question of convincing people who are not innately attuned to that to be attuned to that. It's to, for the folks for whom it is the right option, helping provide vehicles to make it possible. Um, so just to go maybe a direction you intended or maybe a direction you didn't intend, you're right, infrastructure when it comes to entrepreneurship is a big thing. Um, if you don't mind a little bit of pseudo lobbying for a moment, um, the governor uh, about 18 months ago uh, announced a New York State broadband initiative. Um, I think that that's critically important. Um, having high speed internet um, is the, uh, you know, go back 15 years, we were talking about information superhighway to the extent that everybody got so sick of the phrase that we stopped using it. But I think the metaphor is still apt and accurate. And when you think about 
people who are here, I mean, I can, you know, list off a variety of different people I know who are the world's expert in something obscure and they travel the world but happen to live here in Ithaca because they want to be here, um, who need those kinds of infrastructures to be able to make that possible. So when you think about the next 20, 30, 50 years, um, as those barriers go down and physical infrastructure, I think, becomes a little bit less important and digital infrastructure becomes more important, we've got a great opportunity if we can continue to seed that. So I'm hopeful for this broadband initiative and hopefully the governor and the state will continue to invest in it and we'll get better uh, bandwidth infrastructure here. This one little piece of physical infrastructure that has just been so transformational is campus to campus bus. And it's a really specific thing, but it's it's totally just changed everything that I can roll out of bed at 6 a.m. and wake up at 10 a.m. in the middle of in Midtown Manhattan and do the same thing later that day. We've we've effectively uh, become a suburb of, of New York City, and and the fact that you can you know have Wi-Fi and and even you know do work on the commute. Just make your, you know, office mobile for a couple of hours. You know, you just have wheels rolling under your desk instead of uh, instead of not. Um, has has functionally functionally shortened the distance between us and. You know. Uh, I just got to tell one story. Well, you know, well, I just got to tell one story. I think you'll appreciate it. So, so the uh, the campus campus bus. Uh, I got to give a shout out to Jerry Hass. Uh, may he rest in peace. So, uh, Jerry, who is a professor of mine at the business school, uh, you know, he, we joked that he did the leverage buyout of the Agway. Um, and it was him and Al Belosky who way back when said, hey, you know what, um, during the semester, wouldn't it be great if there was a luxury bus to New York? And hmm, they run those buses out to the Hamptons during the summer, but they don't have so many passengers in October, November. What if we hired those buses? And so I just got to give a shout out to them to see the opportunity uh, and go do it. So, and knowing Jerry, it made his life easier. So, right. <laughs> so he made that trip a lot. Um, but, um, to your comment about the infrastructure and the isolation in, in Ithaca, I actually think that that, to some degree, if you look back over history, has been beneficial. Because, because of this challenge of getting here, no one industry could take over. If you look at Buffalo, you know, whether it be the Great Lakes or, or rail, ultimately the throughway, you end up with a concentrated steel industry that you, know, you end up in the 70s and, and you lose an economy. Um, you can go right down Route 20, right? You can go to Waterloo and Geneva and Auburn and keep working your way, skip skinny Atlas, but that's more of a out of town money trust situation than, than anything. Um, and, and those towns have had challenges because they were so concentrated based on their access to transportation. And the fact that here it's been challenging for hundreds of years. Um, there's been a diversity that's grown up and existed in, you know, diversity of, of business, of, of people. It's a constant theme that at least I'm, the drum I'm, I'm beating here. Um, we don't want to lose that because, you know, if you look at Tompkins County performance in upstate New York over the last several decades, if unemployment is the barometer, we have outpaced and outclassed probably every county um, in the state, including uh, New York City and the boroughs as far as the, the ups and downs. So I don't know that it's a negative per se. Just from our portfolio, we have a specialty chemical company, we have uh, a natural organic food company, we have a company that does uh, sterilization of human donor tissue for the, the medical industry, um, diagnostic company, uh, the, the breadth of uh, business opportunities and base technologies in, in the areas is really across the board. I mean, it's not drilling for uh, natural gas, I know that for sure, but um, you know, short of that, there's uh, a very diverse um, group of businesses here. So just to echo that, the most successful entrepreneur that upstate New York has seen in a generation and the fastest company to a billion dollars in history 
um, is one that I jokingly uh, say they're, they're making colloids of bovine protein matrices, otherwise known as Greek yogurt. So Hamdi Ulukaya went in and got an SBA loan, bought up a yogurt factory, uh, and made absolutely something enormous out of nothing. And so um, as much as we're all about it, we can list a variety of success stories of technologies that even to this day, you know, I know what a, a microelectronic mechanical system is, but the, you know, beyond being able to say the word MEMS, that's where my technical knowledge ends. It's been very important to this community and there will always be those kinds of technologies, but it's all over the map. So when we opened Red, when we were talking about it, um, we very deliberately chose a location that was in the center of downtown. There were other locations that people had asked us about, like the uh, the former PNC location um, on the north side, the NYSEG building um, out on 366, a few others. So the first thing we kept coming back to was, you know, this is not a real estate question, it's not a solution to a real estate problem. Um, so that was one thing that was very guiding to us. But the other was that if we were going to try and have an entrepreneurial community, which is really what we're trying to be about, then anchoring ourselves in the community, a stone's throw from the lawyers, the accountants, the um, you know, TCAD, the chamber, other people, um, and being right in the center of things are really important. Um, one thing that I'm tremendously proud of is we have three companies uh, already, we just opened in the fall of 2014, we've had three companies that have been in our space and essentially gotten kind of big to the point where they said, gee, these rules were like you make us clean up after ourselves at the end of the day. That's kind of a pain. Um, and so um, three of them have left. Uh, one is in this building. Um, one is on the commons. One is on the other side of the commons. So all within two blocks of where we are and collectively employ now over 50 people. So um, really important, I think, for us to, to invest in downtown. And we're at the brink of another transformation in downtown. I mean, when you look at the number of beds uh, in terms of apartments, uh, when you look at the number of hotel beds, right? So between the, now the, the, obviously the Hilton Garden Inn, but you've got the renovation of Hotel Ithaca, you've got the opening of the Marriott, and then now a Hilton that's gonna eventually open up. I mean, you've got literally hundreds of hotel beds uh, downtown that weren't there uh, even a decade ago, and, and that can really be transformational to, to this place. I think, I think the, the number is something like $160 million of private investment in, in recent years just in downtown, which is a fairly small, walkable district. And the thing that I like about that most is it's incredibly sustainable development from an ecological, environmental perspective. All of the vertical growth that you get and all of the infill development, as opposed to what you get when you develop in the suburbs is the kind of development that I like to see in the community. And I'm a very proud resident of, of the Commons. I've been living there for four and a half years and uh, I've been involved with the Downtown Ethic Alliance for several years. And, uh, don't you miss any of the oldest? Don't I miss any of the oldest? Well, you're young, so you don't even know what the oldest is. <laughs> well, I don't remember pre-Commons, yeah. yeah. But I, I don't miss the old Commons. I don't miss it. Like, you don't? I don't, don't miss old it. I don't miss the old <laughs> Commons, I can tell you that much. Um, yeah, but I, I'm, I'm wildly in favor of, of the, the direction that we're going when I see, especially with the alternative, uh, when I see what's happening to other... Oh, absolutely. When I see other, what's happening to other cities in, in upstate that are either growing outwards or growing not at all. Yeah. I think, though, it's really important for Ithaca to maintain the diversity, right, of the community in downtown. And as density and infrastructure downtown increases, there needs to be high rises and there needs to be capacity for that. But I will also say there needs to be the neighborhoods. And so, you know, you can look at a place like a San Diego, and we don't want to be a San Diego because traffic's brutal. But, you know, San Diego as a community has done a nice job of yes. maintaining neighborhoods throughout the city with some density downtown. And, and, you know, again, one of the attributes of Ithaca is that there's a place for just about everybody. And, and I think the infrastructure downtown should be respectful of that. And, and the dialogue and discourse that sometimes makes development projects take two or three or five times as long as they might somewhere else are healthy in the long term for a community like ours to be something special and not just what everyone else is. 
It, it's interesting because we, we just came back from uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, we hadn't been there for five or six years. And those communities are struggling mightily with their downtowns. They're big, they're active, but there's a sense of place that seems to be gone. And uh, yeah, some of it is vanilla, some of it's all high rise with no character to it. Uh, and uh, there are places that are actually struggling partially because the, the, the whole economy out there is a weird economy when you really look at it. The real estate economy is totally insane. Uh, but they're having a lot of trouble figuring out how to make senses of place out of places that used to be senses of place. Very, very uh, uh, tight communities that have kind of lost their way over the years. And although we talk about cost of cost of living, apartment costs, and so on, when you start comparing us to New York City or to Silicon Valley, certainly, and, and many other major areas, costs are fairly modest and for, for, for housing. And so it's interesting because internally, I think we are definitely tougher on ourselves than much of the world looks at at Ithaca from the outside. And it all, it, it, it does make its challenges, but, it, it, but we also are able to attract people to come uh, to the community uh, because of, uh, you know, the, the beautiful place that we live and the sense of inclusiveness that, uh, you know, will take nearly anybody. Make the demand known and, you know, Uber, I don't think it solves all problems and it has a whole bunch of other problems, but yeah. You know, I've got three 20-somethings around my household. Um, it's, they get around that way. And, and it, would, it would facilitate in some way, shape, or form part of that issue. Um, and, and I don't know what the answer is, but um, if it's a real problem, I say we put it out there and someone will figure out how to solve it and, and get them over here for, for some cause. But, you know, if we end up, you know, forcing a bus run that uh, a bunch of people think um, is a good idea who aren't the student population, I guarantee it will screw it up and spend a lot of money on having low ridership. So, I don't know, we got to motivate one of them to start a rideshare business or something. I don't know what it is. I have one more question. Piggyback on that. So I, I would just throw out, if you don't mind, uh, so Red Route uh, is a e -Lab, Cornell eLab alumni company. You'll see on the taxi cabs oh, yes. around here the little flag that says Red, Hout, Red Route. So you can actually download the Red Route app and hail yourself a taxi. Uh, not quite an Uber, but uh, you know, same basic purpose, use your phone to hail. Um, I mean, I would just echo uh, what Tony was saying about bus service. The only other thing uh, I would just say, and if you forgive the editorializing, one of the things that one of the potential developers for the, the Treblock building was vilified for was the fact that a they were from out of town um, they were from texas of all places oh my god um, and the name of their company was student advantage and the fact that the word student was in their title um, was you know really i mean just it, it was horrible how could possibly a company named student advantage think of building a building here in town the fact that there are students who come here uh, to this general area um, to be part of not just cornell but tc3 and ithaca college and in fact that company was really looking at demand from ithaca college. Um, I wish uh, that we would do a better job as a downtown and as a city of actually embracing the student population rather than viewing them as pests. Um, because I, I think that they have a lot to contribute and it's part of making this place a welcoming place for them to stay and work and be part of the next generation of permanent residents. You know, Syracuse, to their credit, is doing a nice job of making an effort to transform that, that economy. And there are a number of um, entities that have launched up, a lot of them have you know, copied what we've done here in Ithaca. It's, it's a flattery um, for us, and, and I think there's a level of success there that um, is, is impressive, and it's good for the region. Um, you know, I think Rochester has tried it, I think they have a few other challenges that go along with some large uh, institutions that are going through their own challenges or have gone through their challenges. Um, Syracuse is small enough to, to make it work. I do think there's lessons. 
but um, having a couple of businesses in other parts of upstate, and to your point, the failure, failure is acceptable in Ithaca. Um, it really is. It, it's, and that's uh, an attribute or a trait that when you look at places like Cambridge or Austin or Silicon Valley, it's also acceptable there. You don't have to travel too far outside of Ithaca to find someone who has failed in a business effort to be demonized for the balance of their professional career as, you know, demonized. I'll leave it at that. A couple of days ago, I went to the uh, Center State CEO Regional Economic Forecast, and I just pulled up this slide of real gross domestic product growth, and they had a list, and this is descending order of uh, growth. Albany, Buffalo, Rochester, Utica, Syracuse, and at the bottom, Binghamton. Well, you notice Ithaca is not on the list there. We're just simply too small for to even register, even at the regional level. So in one sense, we're, you know, maybe a very special case uh, and, and perhaps, you know, worthy, worthy of, of special mention and in another, even an hour north of us, we're, they don't even put us on the slide. So we're, it's a very, very interesting situation that we're in, I think. So a couple other stats that I would add. Um, so 15,000 people a day drive into Tompkins County to work. So notwithstanding the fact that when you look at Ithaca as a city, it's 30,000 people, right? So we don't rate by virtue of that when you look at city size. But when you look at the size of the economy, it's actually a different number. So sometimes we get included, sometimes we don't. Um, when I was talking about the top employers, um, the reason I had that front of mind is I recently gave a presentation to an alumni club in Rochester, and I actually compared uh, Tompkins County to Monroe County. In Monroe County, seven of the top 10 are, are nonprofit or government instead of eight for Tompkins County. Um, Kodak isn't even on the list. Kodak peaked to over 60,000 employees in Rochester, now has 1,400. So Kodak employs fewer people in Rochester than Borg Warner employs in Tompkins County. So um, when you look at the top, the seven big employers, the number one in Monroe County is the University of Rochester. Now, um, part of it is they're at 22,000 because they're including their medical system, um, so an even larger number. But the, the parallels now are actually quite interesting. So I do think that when you look at kind of the anchor institutions that have remained after the giant sucking sound of all the steel plants and you know big manufacturers, the carriers of the world um, have left, by the way, interesting story, Willis Carrier, Cornellian, invented air conditioning, and then sowed the seeds of all our demise by enabling people to live in the southern part of the United States. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, be that as it may, um, you know, when you look at what kind of uh, we have remaining, you look at the big cities, it's the anchor institutions of the, um, of the universities and the hospital systems um, that are now the big employers. And we all hold that in common. And I, I think the, the state is realizing that, Cuomo administration does, and is trying to leverage it as best it can. The one thing I just wanted to throw in as an ad, uh, there's a guy named Dane Spangler who works for the Kaufman Foundation who's their vice president of research. He's done some really interesting work looking at how entrepreneurial growth is sometimes in clusters that are unexpected. So he was looking at St. Louis, which made some big investments around biotech, particularly with uh, Washington mm -hmm. University. Um, and then what wound up happening is that this kind of brewery boom, there were a lot of people who left um, Anheuser-Busch after their acquisition. And so now there's a lot of breweries. So they were preparing for a very different form of biotech um, and got you know yeast-oriented biotech. And Instead, Vancouver made big investments about software, trying to think that there would be this corridor between uh, Seattle and Vancouver. And what they actually found their boom is is an exercise apparel with Lululemon and a whole bunch of other um, kind of folks in that kind of ecosystem. And so, um, you know, it just was a real indicator to me uh, that you know these things often happen in unexpected ways. Um, but you know, be able to kind of support and ride your winners when they when they arrive. Thank our panel. Thank you. This was actually very interesting and uh, in a very entrepreneurial fashion went in directions that none of us foresaw. <laughs> Take care. Have a great afternoon.